All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, special City of Libraries, uh, City of Santa Barbara Library Board Advisory Board meeting for April 21st, and I'm going to call, ask the uh, roll call, please. Sure. Eric Friedman. Here. Thank you. Christine Roberts. Here. Thank you. Suzette Naylor. Present. Thank you. Milt Hess. Here. Thank you. Jonathan Glaso. Here. Thank you. And uh, can I get an approval of the March 25th uh, minutes? Is there a motion? Is there a second? Uh, any further discussion on the minutes? Uh, hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, minutes are approved. And are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, hearing none, uh, move on to public comment, and I believe we have one public comment speaker. Uh, if you'd like to come forward and state your name, and you have two minutes. <clears throat> My name is Ethan Shankman. I am native to the local area, born and raised, graduate from Cal Poly after attending SBCC, and have served as an active member inaugurated on the Civil Grand Jury. We set a memorial to remember, poised not to forget, during the 60s Frank Berta operated as barber and had access to the whiskers of our father. Currently front and fountain gauged at less pressure to slide upon surface fixture evenly observed at SBCC rather than tickling, trickling out to resemble the fountain at El Paseo could help prevent a slippery slope of liability without demolition of a deeply held sentiment for locals in the area. Frequent painting garden memorial as what locates corner at State and Carrillo, commercial property, Saks Fifth Avenue, would help. 60% of the respondents under survey funded by the Transit Occupancy Tax Initiative said that as first-time visitors, they are never coming back to the region. Santa Barbara Public Library can reverse this trend for men age of consent 18 or over, Access to the library rooftop balcony, entering liability waiver, would immediately add value to library services. Operating laptop, drinking coffee, smoking tobacco, simultaneous under good weather, meets manner of demographic preference for tourists, downtown Santa Barbara not otherwise met. Because of the unique character and architecture, roof balcony imposed no injury and secondhand smoke exposure to non-smokers. Finally, to, complete with, to comply with written English, equal access within federal guidelines, baggage limitations need to be adjusted as priority, even more than a second language. Inductively, parameters are set to challenge adults over six feet high to enter front lobby rather than simply apply equity in each to a handful. In a classless, graceless society, she loses her rights. Not adhering to equitable standard promotes a discriminatory environment to exclude a height-weight ratio within various individual physiological predispositions, prohibiting benefit to members of the public. I, if there's any clarification in anything I said, I, I'm here to answer. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Mr. Shankman. Sure. Uh, moving on, no more uh, members of the public. We'll go on to new business. And uh, tonight, it's a special occasion, so uh, I'd like to, um, item one is remarks from the chair. Usually we don't have this item, but uh, tonight is a special occasion. It's, to the best of our knowledge, it's the first time in the history of the Library Advisory Board that we are televised. And it's been a, a while coming, and my board members and I are, are excited to have this opportunity. Uh, to share with the public and hear from staff on all the great work that our staff and, and are doing at the library system. And I thought I'd start with a, a quote from um, Andrew Carnegie, and it's on libraries, and says, a library outranks any other one thing a community can do to benefit its people. It is never, it is never a failing spring in the desert. And I thought that it just really got to why libraries are here and how important they are, and being that uh, We've learned that city, the city of Santa Barbara and its residents really love our libraries. But there's so much going on, I don't think that uh, we've done an adequate job of uh, informing. We've done a lot, but this is an opportunity to once again uh, provide information to the public on what it is that uh, the library is doing, how it's transitioning into the 21st century digital world, and they're doing a great job, and we'll learn more about that tonight. And then uh, also the capital and other improvements that are, that are coming. It's an exciting time for our library over the next few years, in the past few years. 
And uh, our ex expectation tonight is to uh, provide the public information on all that's going on, plus the budget, and making sure that they understand the, the real public value that comes from our library and that the resources the city expends on it are, are going to great services. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over uh, to, for item number two. And if, uh, Maria, if you could read, the, read item two, and I'll turn it over to Director Macias uh, to begin the uh, state of the, the library. This is the Director's State of the Library report and presentation. Good evening, Chair Freeman and members of the board. I'm Irene Macias, the Library Director. Um, tonight, we have several staff members here to present. Along with me, Scott Love, Library Services Manager, Jace Turner, Supervising Librarian, Gwen Wagey, Youth Services Librarian, and Maribel Zambrano as Sparza, the Eastside Branch Supervisor. And we're really pleased for the opportunity to share the efforts of the organization in providing services um, and programs to the community. And I do want to add that this presentation will cover the activities and programs of the city, the two city libraries, Central and Eastside, and not the branches that are um, operated through contract with the city of Goleta and the county of Santa Barbara as the board's purview is strictly the two city libraries. Tonight's presentation will include areas uh, shown on the slide. Um, and with respect to the budget, I do want to note that at tomorrow's city council meeting, the finance director will present the fiscal year 15, uh, 2015 recommended operating in capital budget. And after that, the budgets will be posted um, on the city's website and will be available at our two city libraries also. Um, on the organization chart for the library, you'll see that there are two um, library services managers that cover pretty much the entire operation. On the left-hand side, you'll see Scott Love's position. He oversees the central library and all the uh, services and programs there, uh, including a couple of city uh, library-wide uh, programs. That's the technical and digital services and um, also the Our Adult Literacy Program, which is very active. Uh, Library Services Margaret, Manager Margaret Esther oversees all the branches and also some system-wide um, activities such as collection development. That's the selection and purchasing of all the materials that are available at the library and also system administration. You'll see that the library uh, provides a wide range of services to the community um, for um, mem residents of all ages and uh, interests. Um, and today we have um, staff members that will uh, tell you more about these programs, starting with Jace Turner, who will talk about uh, the technology and digital aspects. Good evening, Chair Friedman and members of the board. <clears throat> um, as you know, the library um, is constantly seeking out new and innovative ways to reach the community, identify some of their service needs, and bring those services to them, whether it's in the library or outside of the library. Uh, to that end, we have um, rebranded our digital services, our virtual library. Uh, we called it Library to Go. Um, the Library Go to Go collection is our virtual collection. So it's the collection of downloadable materials that are available um, for patrons to download 24-7 um, from anywhere in the world with a library card and Wi-Fi or cell um, access. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's always available. And in, in addition to the 10,000 e-books and 5,000 audiobooks that we've had in our collection, this year we added um, over 140 downloadable magazines and over 7 million, 7 million um, songs to the library's collection. And I, I, I did the math, and that's about, that's about 20 tracks per CD. That's about 350,000 CDs that we've added to the collection this year. Um, that's Freegal. Uh, Freegal stands for free and legal. Um, that's music that you can download, three songs per week, and also stream three hours per day. Um, 
What makes Zinio and Freegal unique to the library's collections is that they're the first services that we've provided that enable patrons to keep the materials that they download. So unlike the uh, ebooks and audiobooks that, that they borrow for a period of time, these items they get to keep forever. Um, the Edson Smith Historic Photo Collection, this is a really exciting project that we have going on um, this, this fiscal year. We have, for, we've had for decades about a thousand historic photos of early Santa Barbara. Edson Smith um, was a Santa Barbara native born in 1877, and he was the um, secretary for the Santa Barbara Club uh, for about 40 years. And he was an avid collector of historic photographs. Um, the, the library is lucky to have that collection. Um, so this year we have scanned 124 Edson Smith historic photos and cataloged them. So they are now accessible from the library catalog uh, by searching um, Edson Smith historic uh, photo collections. That's really exciting. We expect to digitize probably 100 more next year. Um, technology assistance. The library recognizes that we serve a diverse group of people that have technology skills and needs. And so from the very beginning, we offer a very successful uh, computer coaching program. Um, that service is, 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 um, is, is run completely by volunteers, Monday through Sunday, seven days a week from one to five. Um, patrons can come in and learn how to um, learn basic computer skills, email, um, Facebook, Pinterest. Um, we also offer drop-in assistance, so that is when patrons want to bring in their own devices. Oftentimes we have people that bring to the reference desk their brand new device in the box and they ask, how do I use my iPad? How do I use my, my Kindle? Again, we have volunteers that offer uh, drop-in assistance three days a week, um, helping pa patrons not only download and, and use the library's online services, but also learn how to use their, their devices. The statistics that we have so far for just this fiscal year, the computer coaching program, we've reached 732 patrons for a total of 687 hours of one-on-one -on -one assistance. That's been quite impressive. And the drop-in assistance, we've met with 223 patrons for 139 hours of one-to-one -one assistance. Um, Along the technology track, we also offer a myriad of technology classes ranging from basic computing needs all the way to classes on how to use Facebook and Pinterest and Flickr. Um, um, we also offer makerspace grouping. So once a week, the makerspace, in fact, they're meeting right now. They get to meet once um, on, on Mondays from 5 to 8 p.m. We also have offered tech, technology um, um, 3D printing classes, Python programming classes, um, and many school visits with the 3D printer. So that's the library getting out um, and bringing, well, going out to the schools, bringing our tech technology out to the schools, and also bringing um, folks into the, into the library. And finally, I just found out that the library will be installing a hearing loop in the Faulkner Gallery sometime in May. So that's pretty exciting. This year also, we were able to hire a new full-time librarian, which has been instrumental in helping us launch our social media camp campaign. Primary duties for the new librarian include focus, focusing on social marketing. She's a part of the publicity team. She serves on the makerspace team, handles publicity for youth services, selects books for the teen collection, and organizes some adult programming. Highlights. So far, it's been that she's launched our Facebook and Pinterest page, um, ramped up our media mentions to about 45 per month for the Central and Eastside Library. So that's incredible. Um, and also had a very highly successful Downton Abbey program a couple of months ago, and we look forward to another program coming up in May um, about the book Empty Mansions. The authors will be there, and uh, the former Mayor Sheila Lodge will also be there to talk about the book. New website and new logo. Um, so we are anxiously awaiting our new website. As you probably know, the website that we, our current website was launched in 2007. So a lot of technological developments have happened in the last seven years. The new website will enable us to better integrate the calendar functions um, of the library, pushing out our events to more users. It will also 
help us. Um, it'll be more flexible with, with, with social media. And um, one of the neat things about this new website is that it features responsive design, meaning that it will work on any device that the website is displayed on, which is really neat. And the new logo. This is the first public uh, screening of the new logo, unveiling of the new logo. We should see some new library cards featuring the new logo, I think, in May or June. So thank you. Thank you, Jace. Um, and next, Gwen Wagey will talk about youth services programs. Well, thank you. Good evening, Chair Friedman and members of the board. Um, my favorite thing about the public library is that we get to see kids grow up. So we focus programming from the very youngest, babies and toddlers, all the way up through teens in the youth department. Um, we offer several early learning programs. The first one that I would like to tell you about is Fabulous Fridays. You have to picture 40 toddlers minimum plus an adult. Sometimes it's a parent, sometimes it's a caregiver, sometimes it's a grandparent. And they're all in the room. They're all ready to learn. They're all excited. And we have special guest educators who sing with them, dance with them, teach them yoga, and really get them moving and interacting with their caregivers. Um, the program is so popular because the mothers with young children are just wanting to get out and find community and find something for their child to learn with. So we actually have to turn children away, but we, have, we invite them to play with blocks and puzzles in the children's area. Um, there's a baby that's been coming with her grandmother since the program started in April, and now she walks into the library proudly and waves at every other baby she sees, and the parents have a chance to connect too. So that is the very beginning of foundation of love of learning, love of reading, love of stories. We grow that through our weekly story times. The next step up is a wiggly story time that does focus more on stories but also incorporates mu movement and music. Um, we have tons of family events, puppets, um, magicians, singers, again, all sorts of things that engage whole families. Um, we're also very focused on outreach. We want kids in the community to be excited about the library and drag their parents in. <laughs> so um, we do do story times at several preschools in town. We are at a Parks and Rec food distribution every uh, month telling stories and giving out books. This summer, for the first time, we're collaborating with the food bank to offer lunches in the library. It's called Picnic in the Park. We do groups for parents about using the library, and um, the very exciting thing about that is that recently we've also seen a rise in the number of parents who hear a parent presentation and then come to the library seeking adult literacy help. So it's about the whole family and getting everybody excited about what we offer and um, meeting them where, what they need. Some people just need basic language skills. Some people are looking for great stories. Um, and one other really fun new program we've done is called Reading Ambassadors. And a staff person went two times to an after-school care program gave the kids tips about reading aloud with a partner. Um, they even talked about reading from pictures. So the children that were second and third graders that were unsure about their reading skills suddenly found a way they could read aloud to a younger child. Um, and then we invited the children to come with their class to the library for a tour and had a really special graduation ceremony where they actually pledged to be ambassadors in their community for reading. So they they, they pledge that they will read with their friends and in their neighborhood. Um, the next slide is just a picture of a photo. This is actually at one of our local school libraries, and these kids are so full of energy and excitement for learning. Um, this staff person's talking about getting a library card. Next one. Um, and as the kids grow up in the library, we offer traditional programming for elementary school students. Summer reading is our biggest program. This year, it's going to be focused on uh, science, and it's called Fizz Boom Read. Um, kids read books and earn incentives and, and talk about what they've read in the library. We've had a ton more class and camp tours this year, and actually a really fun one. We had a, a Swedish storyteller last week, and a group of first and second graders were up doing circle dances, and then they invited the counselors to be part of a skit, and the kids just love that. So it's kids that you wouldn't expect to be getting into a Norwegian story just just loved it. And they, they, they even, you know, gave examples of different uh, songs and things, and the kids sang along. 
Um, we're also piloting a homework help program, and that resulted directly out of um, staff in the children's area being constantly asked for help with homework, whether a, a second grader came to the desk and had spelling words they needed help with, they couldn't read them, um, or a parent that just said, my child really isn't interested in getting homework done. Can you help? Um, so that's been booming. And a really fun part of that is ARF. It's a local um, group of people that have trained therapy dogs to be non-judgmental listeners. And so we pair them up with kids. We have, on Tuesday afternoons, about 20 kids every Tuesday now for the last few weeks um, get paired with a, a dog and a, a trainer. And they're, again, we just see kids who are really unsure about reading come in running into the library ready to go and excited. Um, and finally, we are always looking for ways to involve teens in the library. We have always had 20 to 30 teens work with us during the summer, and so community service is a really great part of the library. But we are also involved with the Teen Coalition, which is a group of institutions in town that reach out to kids and teens. And we have um, been testing out craft programs in conjunction with Makerspace. So thank you. Thank you, Gwen. And now Maribel Zambrano Esparza will talk about the programs and services from the East Side Library. Uh, good evening, Chairman Friedman and members of the board. Um, my name is Maribel Zambrano Esparza, as uh, Director Irene Messia stated, and I supervise the East Side Library. <clears throat> it's quite a unique library that in that it is situated in a neighborhood and we are surrounded by several schools and elementary schools. Um, the, excuse me, the Adelante Dual Language Emergence School, Franklin Elementary, and state preschools, and then up the street, uh, year-round Cleveland Elementary. So when we talk about the Eastside Library, we are a sense of community. We, besides catering to our regular patrons who may come in just for a book, we cater to the children and the students and the teachers in the surrounding schools. Uh, we offer English and bilingual story times. We do increase our story times during the school year due to demand. We may have up to 60 children, up to 80 attend our English or bilingual story times. Um, we offer family programs, and that may be a puppet show. It may be uh, crafts. And we like to think that we include the family. We generally do, uh, most of our programs are not geared towards preschoolers. They're geared towards the entire family. We have found that when parents come in with their young children, many of our patrons do not have the advantage of free time or um, have the time themselves to sit down and do a project without their child. So what we have found is that children, uh, the parents, enjoy becoming involved with their children and we have had parents come and ask us and say thank you for having this I would never have been able to do this without the library um, we partner with mobile Waterford program which is a program sponsored by the Santa Barbara County Education System and funded by United Way and it is a little mobile schoolhouse really going around the city um, and it stops at the Eastside Library. They offer computer classes, computer instruction, and a curriculum for preschoolers. And they are, in essence, getting them ready to succeed in school. On Wednesdays, you will see about 24 little preschoolers come into the library where we then have a story time and a craft. Um, and it's a wonderful, successful program. Now, for the mothers um, who would come in and just wait for the children, I had um, someone from the public, a professor, approach me and wanted to do a Spanish book club. Well, it was a perfect fit. We started a Spanish book club. The mothers are discussing uh, right now Carlos's, Carlos Fuentes' book, uh, Fronteras de Cristal, while the children are learning and having a story time. And I had a mother who was just in tears when we started the program coming to me and saying, thank you so much for having this, because it in essence gave them some time to do something as an adult. And if you have children, you know that sometimes 
um, you need to speak to an adult <laughs> to maintain your sanity. Um, in the summer, we started Reading Buddies program last year, and that's because we have several uh, organizations that have events during the summer at Franklin Elementary, such as uh, Fun in the Sun and Parks and Rec um, programs, and they do come over to the library in groups. Well, it occurred to me that some of these youth, instead of just coming and hanging out at the library, would really benefit from, and um, it would be wonderful to pair them with our preschoolers that come for our story time. So we started what we call Reading Buddies, and in we saw children mentoring the preschoolers, and it was amazing to hear the counselors remark about their, their youth saying, I didn't realize that child could read. Or having our little preschoolers come in during regular uh, library hours and looking for their reading buddy. Um, so they didn't realize it, but they were mentoring the younger children and they were also building the reading skills and love for the library that we want them to carry throughout their life. Um, we, vo we offer volunteer opportunities for youth. We also participate with the apprentice program with the city of Santa Barbara. So that is a paid apprentice program. And we are also working with the county um, also with the apprentice program. Um, we offer after-school art and homework. We've partnered with the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, there are credentialed teachers who um, mentor through art and also assist them with homework. Um, it is a wonderful program. They're, it's always full. It's a capacity of 24 students. And uh, these are children from the neighborhood, from the area. All they do is sign up. It's completely free, as, as all of our programs. Um, we like to boast about our beautiful gardens that we have installed in our inside patios. Uh, a couple of years ago, I approached one of our patrons who is a landscape architect and was asking her about what we could do about our patios that weren't as beautiful as I think they could be. And um, so they designed... Uh, garden for us and we worked with the community and we had all volunteers and donations beautify our gardens to where they are attract good insects hummingbirds are drought tolerant and native plants and we did this a few years ago we had no idea we'd be in this drought situation but we're very glad that we did that and uh, they frame our tile murals, which we have in our interior patio beautifully. We have um, tile murals that we worked with the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, also in neighborhood children and families in the summer. We've had a third installation now. And those were children from preschool, perhaps even storyteller, all the way up to an 80-year-old grandmother helped these tiles. So we continue to build a sense of community. Um, we want the people to come to the library and we want to fill their needs, whether it's just being a sense of community or computer classes. Um, so we've been asked quite frequently for computer classes and we have been looking for a bilingual volunteer. We are very close to getting one, unfortunately could not commit. So um, we couldn't wait any longer, so we are now in our second session of bilingual computer classes that um, we are doing with staff. Um, and it's wonderful to see these women who are coming in. It, we have to coordinate it when their children aren't in school. Cannot move the mouse. And today being so excited that they were able to search the Internet, one woman was looking for help in how to better communicate with her deaf son. So she was able to search herself and find on YouTube how to um, improve her sign language skills with her son in Spanish. Um, we also have a beautiful mural on the exterior of our wall, which was the winner of Santa Barbara Beautiful Award last year. And that we worked on with uh, artist and education instructor Manuel Unsueta and several youth from the Parks and Rec Department, the Arts, Com Arts Commission. And these young people were what may be considered youth at risk. Um, these youth designed the mural. We gave them the idea, libraries where adventures begin. 
and they went from there and it is a beautiful mural i would recommend if you haven't seen it to go take a look these young people uh, were inspiring to us they were inspiring and that when they started they were probably very confused not knowing where they were headed by the time they finished that mural every single one of them had been accepted to either city college or university so we like to think that we continue to build communities at the Eastside Library. We do outreach. I go to parents' nights and um, at the preschools and talk about how to read to your child, how to read aloud to your child, the importance of reading. And it's very important that we communicate with many of our patrons in the language that they understand, which may not be English. So most of our, all of our staff actually is bilingual at the Eastside Library. And it's important that we have a welcoming um, atmosphere for many patrons who may f feel intimidated that they're going into a government building. We go out into the community to assure them that this is a welcoming place, that it is a place where they can uh, come in for resources. And if we don't have it at our little library, we can find the information and point them in the direction where they need to go. And to that extent, we were working with uh, Salute Carbajal and Doss Williams in order to coordinate a Franklin service, Neighborhood Services Center, um, which is located at the Franklin Elementary School, where we provide information that is necessary to many of our community area neighbors and patrons, um, such as WIC information, uh, pan food pantry information, uh, where to get medical services. And as I tell them, if you're not finding it there, come to the library because we will find it for you if you can't find what you need at that service center. Um, so that is a brief description of our neighborhood library on the east side. Thank you. Thank you, Maribel, and thank you, Jace and Gwen, also. Um, as you can see, we have a group of very talented and creative and extremely passionate staff members. So I'm very fortunate, as is the community, for that. Um, and next, we have uh, the benchmarks and statistics uh, presented by Scott Love. Sure. Chair Friedman and board members. Uh, Kind of recapping real quickly the, some of these benchmarks that we looked at last year, I wanted to show you how well we're doing, um, especially this last year. Our, um, if you look at the visits per capita, we are significantly higher than the rest of the state or even the nation with 7.1 uh, visits per capita. The paid full-time equivalent uh, per 25,000 people is one of the areas that uh, I think we're doing actually very well in because we're half of the national average. National average having 15.6 and we're only at 8.5 staff members per 25,000. Uh, program attendance, I'm very proud of you. You saw or heard the passion from these three people next to me. And you can see our per capita program attendance is significantly higher uh, than the state average or the national average. Our collection expenditures per capita, this is all the books, uh, audio books, the library to go that uh, Mr. Turner was speaking of earlier. And you'll see that in uh, late uh, 2009 and 2010, we dipped below the state averages um, after we'd done very well in the early 2000s. But now we've significantly increased and uh, we're showing that we're potentially higher than the national, but we have no data on the national uh, mean at this point beyond 2010, but you can see significantly uh, increased expenditures. Our circulation or the, the checkout borrowing of materials, you see it's uh, continue to rise every year. We only had a little dip there during uh, times when we had to reduce our hours and cut Monday service and had some furlough. But other than that, it's significant, it keeps going up significantly every year. And if you look from 2001 to 2014, is a 54% increase in circulation. Just the digital circulation, it's even more dramatic as, as we've added more materials and it keeps going up. You can see from 2009, 7,500, and we're projecting this year to finish just short of 100,000 in circulation. And this doesn't even include the new Freegal service, which isn't computed in here. 
And that was really it for my statistics. And I'm going to go through the budget quickly. So the first slide here is to show you the uh, total library department, not just the city branches, but the total department budget. You can see um, total budget is 6.8 million. 70% of that is the general fund, the city branches, and 30% of that is are the county branches. Um, in an inverse here, the county uh, service area is 60% of the population, and the city branches are only 40% of the population. So this is our history from fiscal year 12 through what proposed for the fiscal year 15. And you'll notice on here that for fiscal year 15, the fines and fees we have dropping by roughly 30,000. And that is our proposed elimination of the library holds fee, which will open up the getting materials regardless of your economic situation for uh, patrons for any of our branches to get them from other branches. Also, it's worth noting on here that in the donations line of the 97,000, that 75,000 of that comes from the uh, Santa Barbara Friends. And when we break out our, our spending of our budget on this is, again, just the city libraries, we're seeing the, uh, the percentage um, of each area, and our total budget for the city branches is four point seven six million. So this is just kind of a position history. Back in two thousand ten, we had thirty two point four uh, full time employees, uh, permanent full time employees. We dipped to uh, twenty six point seven five a few years back. We've gained back one position, but. All this increased CERC and increased programming has, has come at uh, just the 27.75 full-time positions. And similarly, with the hourlies, we, we peaked back in 2010, and we've gained back a little bit the last couple of years, but with the efficiencies, self-check, and repurposing the way we use staff, we have not had to increase back our hourlies. Although I'm, fiscal year 14, uh, 14 shows in here at 23,000, and I believe it's going to end up significantly higher because of grant monies we've received for some of the programming. And this is just kind of a breakdown of the same data in a, a historical fashion. So you can see on here uh, each of the areas as we go forward. It's, again, it's worth noting on here our proposed budget this year for uh, book acquisition. So all our collections, digital library to go, also is 419000 that's the highest it's been since 2005. And some of our key objectives for this coming year is upgrading all the computers at the uh, east side and central libraries to Windows 7 and updated versions of Office to help better serve our patrons. Achieving a circulation of 865,000, that's the highest circ I think we've had that I in times I've gone back, I don't, I don't think we've had anything higher. Just a slight increase from this year. Uh, digitizing more of the local photographs that Mr. Turner spoke about earlier and raising, uh, we, our goal is one million this year, we should make it, and the goal is to raise an additional 750,000 next year. Proposed service enhancements that will go before council is um, really or in enhanced Wi-Fi at both of the city branches, uh, like increasing bandwidth five times. Uh, this will significantly uh, assist the public with their ability to use the Wi-Fi and um, help the staff who, try, who use Wi-Fi for mobile reference and for all the technology programming. We're also having uh, electrical outlets put in the 26 study carols on the upper floor. And then lastly, there's an increase to the book budget. We already talked about it being 419000 but that includes 30000 additional that's being proposed uh, for this year. And I'll turn it back over to Ms. Macias. Thank you, Scott. Um, 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about our capital improvement projects. Uh, we have been working for a number of years on two major projects that take up a lot of staff time and energy. Um, the first is the Children's Library. It's something we've actually been dreaming of for many years. The current uh, library is really inadequate uh, to provide service, uh, modern library service to our community. Um, some of the uh, features are, first of all, it will move to the lower level where it will have six, over 6,000 square feet up from the current uh, 1,500 square feet. In fact, when Gwen established her homework, uh, homework center, we needed to take out shelving in order to put tables into that space. Um, and some other things, you can see the photo image of some cozy reading nooks where um, parents and children can read together. Dedicated space for story time and programs and the homework program. Um, and dedicated areas for different age groups, including the manipul manipulative play area. <laughs> uh, and appealing displays and collections. We'll also have ADA compliant restrooms, a staff desk where staff can easily see kids um, throughout the space, unlike the current space. So we're very, very excited about this project. Um, the city contributed half a million dollars towards the project. We've raised an additional two million, um, and the total construction cost will be around 3.1 million. We're right now in um, fi the final design phase, hoping um, to start construction in January with a grand opening in June of 2015. And then um, that is such a gorgeous photo of the Faulkner building um, back in the 1930s. Uh, so this project began as a redevelopment agency project. Um, and we worked with landscape architects Campbell and Campbell uh, to design the new plaza. And after receiving uh, po positive comments at the Historic Landmarks Commission, uh, the project was put on hold due to the dissolution of the RDA agency. Um, and then um, about a year ago, uh, funding was identified to move the project forward. And um, as the Santa Barbara Museum of Art is also be uh, it, beginning an expansion project. We agreed to work together to coordinate some of the needs of the museum and um, to make it a, a accessible and inviting space for the community. To date, there is no uh, funding for construction, but we do have funding to take us through the final design phase. And that concludes our, our program. We welcome your comments and questions. Well, thank you, Director Macias and staff for that uh, excellent report. And uh, before I turn it over to my uh, fellow board members for comment, I'll check if there's any public comment. And uh, seeing that there's no slips, we'll turn it over to uh, colleagues. Excuse me one moment. For this item. Did you want to speak to this item, Mr. Shankman? Well, this is only one if you emphasize. Uh, well, could you come to the, up to the front? Sure. I have two minutes. Correct. I just want to emphasize this. We set a memorial to remember, poise not to forget. During the 60s, Frank Berta operated as barber and had access to the whiskers of our father. Currently, front end fountain gauged at less pressure to slide upon surface fixture evenly, observed at SBCC rather than trickling out to resemble the fountain at El Paseo, could help prevent a slippery slope of liability without demolition of a deeply held sentiment for locals in the area. Frequently painting garden memorial as what locates corners at State and Carrillo, commercial property, Saks Fifth Avenue, would help. This is what we see, that it has, um, that the fountain was on a little too high on pressure and an erosion has occurred around the garden that is artificial and didn't have to occur. And if these um, simple modifications had been in place, there wouldn't be such a drastic need for an overhaul. And that these slight details could 
maybe save our money or put that in other priorities like making the rooftop balcony um, more accessible to the public with whatever retrofit that has to occur up there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shankman. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my board members uh, for any comments on the library services. Chair Friedman, if I might suggest, I have questions for each of the speakers. So if we perhaps went one person and asked if each person wanted to ask, that might work. I don't know if others feel that way. Sounds good to me. Go ahead. We'll start with you, Ms. Neal. Thank you. Um, I also want to repeat what Irene Messia has said. I'm impressed with your enthusiasm, thoroughness, and detail. And these are questions that are probably purely for clarification. Um, Mr. Turner, I am, when you were talking about the digital collections, I wondered, do they completely duplicate or they merely overlap our print editions? That's a very good question. Um, at this point, they, they overlap. They do not duplicate the current collections in our libraries in terms of the books and the audio books that are on our shelves. Many times we have the same titles if they're available, but they don't, but the collection does not actually duplicate the entire collection. So a follow-up question is, I mean, one of the things about libraries that I am very strong about is equality and parity. And if, do you anticipate the digital collection growing larger than the print edition? And in that case, I guess the question is, how do you... Uh, provide for those people who do not have electronic devices? That's a very good question. Um, we do purchase the physical book, the large print copy of the book for those who need larger print, also the book on CD. So, sorry. Oh, so, um, and then additional to the, the ebook and the audio book. So I think that we'll continue to purchase the, 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 the formats that our, serve, our, our public is asking um, to check out. The other thing about what I'm seeing in the new digital world in terms of collections is, like with Freegal, we have access to 7 million songs. And when we get to the point of downloaded, downloadable um, DVDs, I'm sure there'll be huge collections there. So it really won't be a, a buy one copy per model as it is with our, with our, our art books and DVDs and, and music CDs. So... Thank you. And I have one last question sure. for you. You talked about the Edson Smith Historic Collection of Photographs, which is an interesting uh, concept. I wondered, does the library uh, currently have a policy of interface with other agencies or nonprofits that actually have other historic photos? In other words, is there a formal structure if they wish to borrow them, display them, interpret them? And the subsidiary question to that is, how are you conserving the original photographs? So right now, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but the Edson Smith photo collection, the date ranges, did I mention it's from the 1880s to about the late 1920s? Mm -hmm. So it's a really special period for, for Santa Barbara. Um, at this point, we loan them out to users if they want to use them for research or for even publishing in their books. We just ask that they credit the library. We've been doing that for years, um, loaning out the photographs. In terms of what we're doing for their archival care, that's a very good question. And ultimately, I think once the photos have been digitized and cataloged and are available to, to the public from our online catalog, we would probably seek a, a better, um, more archival home for the, for the collection itself. Thank you. Director Macias, um, do you perceive any unmet needs in the community for the library? Um, um, I, there are many unmet needs, and um, you know we have limited resources, so we currently are focusing our efforts. Um, in a couple of areas, first of all, youth services, as we've been planning this children's library and the supporting programs that come along with it. Um, and we also have been devoting more um, efforts towards uh, reaching at our outreach to the community in terms of children. Um, and 
we have the Library Plaza project that takes up a, a lot of time, although not the frontline staff, but it is um, a huge priority for the library in terms of um, its space and ability to um, be more an attractive place for the public. We have um, we have the the front area for us is problematic in terms of security, um, in terms of our ability to program. We really want to extend, expand our programming to um, the outside of our building too, um, and. There are many unmet needs with a senior population. We do, um, I think we do a little bit in many areas and a lot in the area of youth literacy. Thank you. Uh, the, the perception I had from um, the, the reports of your senior staff is, is that the children's program is just phenomenal, uh, absolutely phenomenal. And I'm wondering if some of the initiatives that have been taken at the East Side branch uh, to involve adults in, more actively in the, um, well, in, in using the library for their own personal development, if some of those concepts could be applied to the Central branch. Well, as a matter of fact, um, we forgot to mention that we recently received a state grant. We don't know the dollar amount, but I, I do want to say that at the same time, I pitched an idea to the state library uh, for a, an, a mobile app for the black gold system, and the staff pitched a grant for uh, a family uh, family literacy program, which I think Gwen can tell you a little bit more about. The staff was successful. I was not, so I'm very proud of them for that. Um, and we had asked for $125,000 to do these very similar things, and Gwen will tell you a little bit more about it. So um, at this point, we don't know the dollar amount. So the idea that we pitched was that while students need homework help, often there are parents that need adult literacy help and they don't have a way, kind of like Marvell talked about, they need a place to be adults. And they try to come for literacy tutoring and they've got th two or three children that need entertaining. So what we hope to do is incorporate homework help, reading together time with a time when parents can come for their own training and again, work with the whole family. Asking. Thank you. And I have a question for Mr. Turner. Um, will, do you expect that we will be able to, to uh, restore any of the online services that had to be canceled during the uh, depths of the recession? I'm thinking of uh, genealogy in particular, uh, but I know that there were some other services that we had to cancel as well. That's a good question, and I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, we're constantly reviewing different types of databases and online services that we can provide to the public. And the genealogy one is, is one that, that gets regular mention. People are interested in the genealogy research. We've been able to divert, or I should say, really refer patrons with those kinds of requests to the genealogical society. They, that's what they do. They, they do that very well. We have a good relationship with, with um, the librarians there. So I feel like if that's being met in the community, then we might want to try and find other areas that aren't being met and, and, and try and provide those services. So in, in, that, in terms of the genealogical research databases, I really am not sure at this time whether we would be adding that back. Other databases that we lost, I'm trying to think. That's really, there was an automotive one that I think we, we used to have, and that actually had not great Usage. What we constantly do are, are we, 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 we run reports, we, we examine the statistics, and we look at the cost per use, cost per search, just like we do with, with anything, any service that we provide at the library. And though it was beneficial to about 30 people or so a month, um, it wasn't really, it didn't really seem to justify the, the cost of the database. 
I also want to add that um, those databases were purchased um, as part of our black gold um, participation. And as such, we got a substantial discount for subscribing. Um, black gold voted to not continue the subscription. So we picked up the ones that we felt were really critical. But um, as Jace mentioned, we looked at the statistics and had to make some tough choices. So. Whether we bring them back or not um, depends on the demand, um, whether we can talk black gold into it sometimes. Uh, there are a lot of different factors. I'd like to, to add uh, one of the reasons that this even started the state of the library started back uh, about three or four years ago was because we had to make a lot of difficult choices. And there was no good choices. So what we came up with was to have this presentation, and we did it at the library at the time, to hear from the community on what the priorities were. And out of that, the, those that were kept came out of those discussions, and those that, that unfortunately we had to do without, um, came a lot of those came out of those discussions. So I just want to provide some context on that. Uh, Commissioner Roberts, sir. I have a question for the staff, just um, if someone could speak briefly to what the reference librarians um, are doing now that we have Google and so many people can get so many questions from Google that they needed a reference librarian for. I know that you guys are still very busy and I'm just curious as to what's occupying your time and what your job is like now. Well, I can answer to some of that. Um, that's a good question, and you'd be surprised that we still get asked a lot of questions at the reference desk. But primarily, we are we're, we are repurposing the reference librarians to work on programming, collection development work, website work, um, really overseeing and um, training volunteers, bringing volunteers into the, in, into the in, into the library, reviewing statistics. And also really trying to figure out where we want our library to be, not just tomorrow, but in the next five to ten years. So. Thank you. Any other comments? I have a few more questions. Um, this is for Ms. Nagy. It's, I'm interested in the homework help that you talked about, and I may have missed this information. Is it a formal structured homework help situation where you actually have trained tutors? Or, and as a subsidiary question to that, are you using the teenagers to help you? And then a subsidiary question to that, when um, nonprofits like Boys and Girls Club exist, are you not partnering with them in terms of using their facilities or their tutoring services? Mm -hmm. um, at this point, it is drop-in. And what we find is, again, thinking about families, everybody is so busy um, we want to have as many hours available to them so they can stop and think, oh boy, we need help. Let's go to the library right now. Um, they'll be there till 7 when they're closed. You know, and actually, we started the program at 3.30 in the afternoon right after school, and it's busier around 5. So what we're seeing is that families need a little bit of a break, time for a snack, and then they're coming in rather than doing it. So it is a learning process right now. Um, we are not calling it formal tutoring. We do have, we have some incredible volunteers already. There is one who's a very experienced math teacher, but in general, we're, we do train. There's an hour and a half training, um, and it's more about approaching children, um, finding out what they need at the moment, and encouraging them and working with them within kind of basic library resources. Um, we do, we have worked with a lot of community groups. We do have camps that visit us and things. But again, we're, right now, we're reaching out to the parents that are using the library or might use the library because they need that support. Did I answer all of your questions? Okay. <laughs> I think so. I, I guess in my mind, I'm projecting forward into the future in terms of partnering with these nonprofits so that we're not duplicating services in three different places mm -hmm. and training half trained. Tutors. Absolutely. And we do, um, already what we've seen is some students through the school district do have uh, an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one tutors um, regardless of their financial ability. Um, so actually some of those groups come to the library to do assessments. And then the parents say, oh, wow, you're here too. And, you know, I have this person one or two hours a week, but I can come for more. Um, so it's not as, it's kind of more support and encouragement than really specific. Mm -hmm. 
And I have one last question. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go. All right. And that was for Ms. Zambrozo Esparza. I'm sorry. Um, when you talked about interaction with the schools, and particularly in the area around the library, is that a formally structured partnership you have with the school where they um, explain their library resources that they have and see what you have that they don't have, and then they, you sort of coordinate resources as well as um, activities? Um, thank you. Um, uh, Adelante Charter School, Dual Language Immersion School, does not have their own library. So we are their library. Uh, we have several class visits throughout the week, regular class visits. Um, and the classes range from kindergarten up to sixth grade. And we have some wonderful teachers that we do work with regularly who make a commitment to visit the library weekly. And um, these children are amazing. It's, it's amazing to see these kids come into the library excited to be at the library, excited about choosing books. Um, with Franklin Elementary, uh, we work with them in a sense that we also um, distribute Reading is Fundamental through them or the free book program. Um, and we work on occasion. I work with them for, uh, to promote the summer reading program. So we'll do presentations at Franklin Elementary and at Adelante. And with the um, uh, preschool groups, um, I do parent nights. So I work with the teachers when they have uh, parent teachers nights or uh, open house. I will go and speak to the parents and do presentations about the library, what our services are what we have to offer, and then I will also do presentations for them and Hippie at our library on how to read to your child, how important it is for your child to see you reading, and um, even if it's a cereal box. And um, so I do work with them on a structured manner, um, but mostly it's to let them know what services we have to offer. Um, there in the neighborhood. Thank you. I think it's great that you provide a school with its entire library resources. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, con continuing along that, uh, one of the there's a community discussion going on on, on how we can best serve our, our youth and, and do prevention. And I, learning today and, and doing our, our site visits at the East Side Library, I see a lot of, of great programs. So one of the questions I have is, what time of do you see the students coming directly from school after school to the library? And if so, um, when they get there, what programs directly do you see them using the most frequently? Well, I think it's fantastic if you're in the area at 1 o'clock on Thursday afternoons, um, Adelante gets out of school early and you will see them running through the parking lot to our library. Um, when they come into the library, um, one of our wonderful things about a public library is that you can do what you want at the library to a certain extent. Um, and so some of them will play games. However, it, you will also see children doing their homework. And um, when I, I'll make my rounds and say, oh, you're not playing on the computer? No, I'm doing my homework. Amazing. Um, so uh, we offer, then we also will schedule afternoon programs um, so that when they do come, we might have a puppet show at 3.30 or a craft at 4 o'clock. Um, but we tend to see the children come after school. Uh, and on Saturdays, it still amazes me that we still have families who come in for their books or come into the library. So many of our children do not have computers at home. So it is very important that we have computers available to the children to come in and do their homework, use our resources, whether it's for research or printing. Uh, many of our children in our community do not have access to a computer, much less a printer. So printing their homework is, is a wonderful asset that we offer. Um, besides using the computers, I'd like to say if they need a place to hang out, what a better place than to hang out at the library. Yes. Mr. Love, a question about the goal to achieve 865,000 circulation. What are the drivers that will enable you to achieve that goal? Um, I, I think the main drivers are is our diverse collections that we have. Um, 
adding this library to go um, act gives more people access to the collections than, than ever, ever had it. People are now getting access, as Jay said, without ever coming into the library. So the convenience of those digital collections, uh, not having to go back to return the item, that's a driver. Getting more of the popular materials that the patrons want um, in the hard copies, the books, the DVDs, um, those are drivers and anything that, that makes makes it easier for our patron to get materials and and getting more materials did you mention uh the elimination of the hold fee ah yes <laughs> and the elimination of the hold fee we we think will will drive it up even higher does that suggest then that <clears throat> the uh circulation number is really an outcome of something else that uh, the, the drivers perhaps should be the goal so for example the size of the digital collection the uh, ease with which somebody can um, borrow a book the ease now with, with uh, that somebody can place a hold those are the drivers and should perhaps the goals be set in terms of of those drivers rather than the circulation number, which is simply an outcome. I, I think you're right. I think we, we look at the circulation numbers as definitely as an outcome, but I think you hit on all the points. You kind of were answering your own question as you stated it. Uh, yes, um, that is one of the things that um, we talk about getting away from numbers as much as possible, but circulation is one of the standard um, uh, data points that the state library uses and that um, national public library data uses. So um, oftentimes, and, and we, also, we disagree that that's the best way to, to measure the success of a library, but that is one of the main um, points that people look at when, when looking at how good a library is doing. So I just have two follow-up questions and we'll move on to the next item. Uh, uh, for Director Macias, could you restate the, the timeline for the, the children's library? And then could you also provide a, an update on the status of the, of the third floor, or second floor patio? Yeah, okay. Um, so we're currently in the process of final design. Um, the architect, LPA Architects, has indicated that by early fall we'll be they'll be pretty much done with final design, um, and then we'll have the bid process. Uh, and again, um, our public works project manager has indicated that we should be in construction in January of 2015, with the project completed by June of uh, 20. Wait, did I say 15? 2014. Oh, yes, 2015, and done that June. Um, and the second question was the... It was the status of the, of the patio. Oh, yes. Yeah, so we, ha we locked uh, the patio on the second floor about three years ago um, because the flooring was... Um, a safety issue, um, our risk management department um, asked us to, to close it. So um, it is currently on the city's capital improvement uh, program. Um, it did not receive funding for, or there is no recommended funding for next year. Um, so we'll, it'll, it'll continue on, on the um, program uh, until the point where it does get funding or whether, um, you know, there's the possibility of raising money. Otherwise, we would um, include it in our, the library's future capital programs that the library could potentially fund. All right. Well, um, any further comments from board members? Well, I want to I thank uh, staff for a great presentation and, and and very informative in all the great work that you're doing. And so now we'll move on to the second part of, of, the, of that, the budget review and recommendations. If, um, Maria, if you could read item three uh, into the record. Item three is budget review and recommendations. A, receive an av overview of the financial year 2014-2015 proposed budget, and B, 
the Library Board provide comments and recommendations on the proposed 2014-15 budget and that the Library Director forward these recommendations to the City Council. Thank you. So since we did hear uh, in the last item uh, the budget, if you could, uh, Director Macias, just provide a, a brief snapshot of what we just heard to refresh our, our memories and then uh, from, we'll go from there. Yes. Um, so again, the entire library department budget is at $6.8 million. Um, the central and east side libraries together, the city libraries uh, are $4.7 million. And you'll see um, our revenues. We will generate a total of one, almost $1.2 million with the city providing uh, the rest of our funding at $3.58 million. And this just describes the various aspects. You'll see that salaries and benefits are the greater part because we are a service organization. Um, we have lost positions over time, but um, I like to tell everyone that we're doing more with less these days through efficiencies and creative, passionate staff. Um, and we, are, we do have quite a number of hourly employees. And we are looking at a total expenditure budget of $4.7 million for next fiscal year. All right, thank you. Before I turn it over to board members for comment, is there any uh, public comment, Maria? Uh, hearing none, I will open it up to fellow board members for feedback on the budget. I have a question. Mr. Hess. Uh, Director Macias, the salaries and benefits uh, are a bit higher than this year. The proposed salaries and benefits are a bit higher. Uh, the headcount is the same. Uh, I assume then that this is um, salary increases? Yes. Um, there, uh, there's a 2% salary increase for staff. Um, and I will point out that sal staff went several years without uh, an increase. In, in fact, um, there were 5% furloughs for two years and then a 4% furlough the third year. So now the city revenues are looking better and um, staff will receive a 2% um, salary increase. Uh, uh, Irene, or, um, yes. Director Macias. <laughs> I'm noticing on the um, city library's revenue, um, it's not on that screenshot, but the donation and library gifts. What's the distinction between a donation and a library gift? It, donations are um, gifts that we, ex that we are expecting in the coming fiscal year, and so it's um, uh, an educated guess. Library gifts is the use of gifts that had been given to the library in the past are being held in, a, in a, a gift account and we are choosing to use them. What you see there is actually the amount that we uh, receive, well, close to the full amount that we receive every year as a distribution through a bequest, the Peggy Maximus Fund, which you've heard me speak of in the past, and we will be receiving an annual distribution from that um, into perpetuity. So that's a, a very generous gift from um, a community member. Thank you. And just to be clear, it, it's a designated gift for the purchasing of books, uh, support the library, the or is it? Peggy Maximus has no strings other than um, to benefit the central library. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments on the budget? Well, if there aren't, um, is there a motion on, on the budget? Mr. Chair, I move that the board recommend to City Council to approve the proposed budget, including, el including elimination of the $1 hold fee. There a second? Second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 
Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. We'll uh, forward that to, to the City Council. And thank you for a great uh, budget and presentation. And for that, we'll move on to our next item, which is any board staff communication. And I'll open that up to uh, library staff or board members. Hearing none, then we'll talk any future agenda items for our next meeting. Mr. Hess? Uh, I would like to, excuse me. I, I would like to see uh, at some point, not necessarily at the next meeting, but uh, at uh, a meeting in the near future, um, a breakout of the budget by function within the library. In other words, um, you know, how salaries are allocated among the departments within the library, how um, it, other expenses are allocated among the departments within the library, so that rather than just an aggregate figure, uh, we can understand where the funding is going in terms of the functions that the library performs. Um, yes, we'll look at presenting that at a future meeting. Thank you. Well, I'd like to close this by our, announcing our next regular meeting is Tuesday, May 27th, and it's our normal uh, time, and that is at uh, noon at the Faulkner Gallery. And also, I'd just like to again thank staff for the great work you're doing uh, for the community. And also that uh, we made it through our first meeting, a uh, televised meeting, and it's a relief. We've been planning this for quite some time. So uh, any feedback from members of the public here or at home is greatly appreciated on how we can improve this because our goal is to use our April meeting from year on out to do our review and, and, and going forward so the council has, uh, has feedback going into budget and also the community has a chance to look at the library standalone as we go into budget season. So hopefully we will be back next year and any feedback again is uh, greatly appreciated. And uh, with that, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.